Welcome to the Retirement Lifestyle Show. I'm your co-host, Roshan Langani, here as always with Adrian Nicholson. Adrian, how are you doing today? I'm great, Roshan. It's good to see you. I'm looking forward to today's podcast. Yep, great to see you too. I'm really excited for this. Uh, I know I feel like we say that all the time, but we pick topics we're interested in, so that that's uh, normal. And this episode, we're going to talk about Buffett's annual letter. So Berkshire Hathaway's chairman Warren Buffett uh, put out puts out his annual letter. It makes news everywhere. We read it every year, and uh, I'm really excited to break it down. Uh, what he started it off this year talking about Munger, who passed away on November 28th, you know, before, uh, you know, a little over a month before his 100th birthday. And here he says something that I think is very important. I'm going to read it. And it says, um, it, it, it says, nevertheless, Charlie in 1965 promptly advised me, Warren, forget about ever buying another company like Berkshire. But now that you control Berkshire, add to it wonderful businesses purchased at fair prices and give up buying fair businesses at wonderful prices. In other words, abandon everything you learned from your hero, Ben Graham. It works, but only when practiced in, at a small scale. I think that is a very important part of this year's annual letter, uh, just because this is what built the company Berkshire Hathaway, this change. And this is the change that uh, I think makes Warren Buffett the greatest investor is he's talked at length. It's all about how um, Munger gave him this advice and it took him time to, uh, to accept it and focus on it. Uh, Adrian, what thoughts do you have just at the, at the start with that, that statement or that advice that Charlie Munger gave Warren Buffett? Yeah, I'm glad you started out with that because that's the first one on my list as well. And that was really at the root of this letter that Warren Buffett was trying to describe and let people know about how when you're looking at investments, businesses, whatever it is, you have to look at it internally just to see, is it well run? What's the future look like for this business? And then you have to ultimately decide whether the price you're paying for it is something that is fair, valuable, or whatever, whatever it is, that's just a judgment that you have to make on the spot. And that can really help you become a successful investor or not. Yeah, uh, very, very true. And, you know, um, in uh, the book, we covered this book on one of our one of our episodes. It's called Where the Money Is Value Investing in the Digital Age by Adam Cecil. And he calls this Buffett 2.0. So he calls mm -hmm. uh, I'm sorry, va value 2.0 value 1.0 is Benjamin Graham buying uh, cheap stocks. And the risk with buying really cheap stocks is a lot of them are cheap for a reason. Some of them go out of business. But Graham was looking at it because of his bank uh, background as a banker as as uh, buying it for less than it's worth. So if it's under if it goes out of business, it still has value. And then what Cecil calls value 2.0 is Buffett focusing on business quality rather than price alone. And um this was, you know, as we said, advice given by Munger. Uh, and this is what I think is the major change Buffett made that led him at one point to be, you know, the wealthiest man out there and, a, and you know, a billionaire many times over times over now. So I think reading this, uh, anyone reading this, I think you take this away. And I think this is something you hold on to and look at. I know this is what I look for when I'm looking for in uh, stocks to invest in as well is I want a good business and I want it at a, at a good price. And that's very much the influence of uh, Munger and Buffett as I'm looking for these things. So I, I to me, this is one of one of the most uh, valuable uh, things in this letter. But there there are so many nuggets, so much, so many good things in here. Uh, Adrian, what do you have next on your list? Well, just expanding on that, I thought this part was really interesting just to expand on the wonderful business where Warren Buffett says patience pays off and that one outstanding business can offset many inevitable mediocre decisions. So I thought that part was funny just hearing that come from Warren Buffett where he was just being straight up with the shareholders saying, hey, you know, I've made some uh, bad decisions in the past, but if you find a lot of good businesses out there, good investments out there, 
in the long run, that will really hold a lot more weight when it comes to running your your business and investing. Yeah, I, and Buffett is very humble in his letters. He's one of the few, uh, you know, him and um, Munger. There are a few of them out there, but investors that talk about the mistakes as well as mm-hmm. they talk about the wins. And this reminds me of last year's annual letter where he said, uh, he's in a business where your your uh, correct decisions outweigh your errors." And what that what that means is, you know, hypothetically, let's say you buy a stock for a, two stocks and they're a hundred dollars each. And uh, the one of them goes up twenty percent, so it's worth one twenty. The other one goes down twenty percent, so it's worth eighty. Well, you still have two hundred bucks, but the one that that made one twenty is now uh, is now about sixty percent of your portfolio, and the one that lost is now forty percent of your portfolio. So your winners outweigh the losers just by the nature of being winners, which is what Buffett talked about last year. Which, as you said, you talked about patience. Uh, we've had an episode in the past that that talks about this as well, just being the patient investor. And I've referenced this other other thing before uh, that I'll try to look up. But Fidelity did a study where dead people performed better in their portfolio than the living, because if you're dead, you can't place trades. So people that passed away and still had accounts open did better. And why? It's just because they held on to the portfolio. I'm a big fan of being a patient investor, spending your time and effort on finding the right investment and then just holding on to it. We even, um, when we talked about the book 100 Bagger by Chris Mayer, we talked about the same thing, the coffee can portfolio where you would buy your stock and get their certificates and just put it in a coffee can and just let them go in that coffee can. And then you open it up you know, decades later and you see and your winners will outweigh your your losers and you'll probably have some good good performance there as well it does you do research it at the beginning but i like that point that you picked up upon that that patient investor uh as well what's the next one on your list i may have something to add on depending on where you go from here yeah of course the next one on my list is some more advice from warren saying never risk a permanent loss of capital and just reading through his whole letter, I think that's really a big theme that Warren really tries to drive home with, just looking for strong companies that make money, strong balance sheets. They're not over leveraged, taking on a lot of debt, which can ultimately wipe out some businesses out there. So he's really trying to just say, hey, just avoid any permanent loss of capital as much as possible. Yes, there's going to be mistakes out there, but then that's what we were talking about before, try and have try and look for those wonderful businesses, those good companies that over the long term are going to stay resilient and still be around to this day. And you were talking about Buffett being humble in that that um, same paragraph you just mentioned. The next sentence I love, it says this this modest aspiration the aspiration of uh, uh, avoiding permanent loss of capital, this modest aspiration wasn't the case uh, when Birdie went all in on Berkshire, but it is now. So he talks about his sister, Birdie. Mm-hmm. But I, the point I think he's making here is that when he, Warren Buffett, bought Berkshire Hathaway, they were a cigar butt, a gram type company, and um, meaning that they could go out of business. And Berkshire Hathaway made suit lining. He knew at the time that China was undercutting the costs And Berkshire Hathaway, the suit lining business, did eventually go out of business, meaning a permanent loss of capital. So that, once again, is that Buffett 2.0 or value 2.0 thinking of never uh, of avoiding permanent loss of capital. Now, I read his letters and I take I probably highlight and take too many notes. So, Adrian, you're a little bit ahead of me uh, with the permanent loss of capital Mm -hmm. piece. Uh, but let me give you a couple others. And uh, once we're, we're, we're back there, I'll ask you about your list uh, again. But he says um, uh, at Berkshire Hathaway, they're focused on a different type of investor. So he had said um, investors who trust Berkshire Hathaway with, uh, with their savings without any expectation of resale, resembling the attitude of buying a farm or a rental stock rather than those who prefer purchase of lottery tickets or hot stocks. And um, later on, he talks about how the stock market right now, 
does resemble uh, gambling very much. So this kind of goes hand in hand. And I think for, for our listeners, it's, a, it's once again, a very valuable point. If you're buying the hot stock, that's kind of like a lottery ticket, except you have more than one drawing is the way I would, I've, I've compared this thing in the past. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with a hot stock. It's, it's just you're buying based on the value of a business. Unless you're catching it early, that you're typically not buying the hot stock if that's what you're what you're buying. So it's really got to be long term uh, focused. And he then talks about his uh, sister. I mentioned her when I read the second quote, uh, Birdie. Uh, he talks about his sister, Birdie. He says uh, she is smart and wise, and that's the kind of investor that Berkshire Hathaway is, is looking for. And he's, one of the other things he points out, he says she is sensible, very sensible, instinctively knowing that the pundits should always be ignored. Uh, and once again, always ignored, not, not sometimes. So he speaks out against the hot stock and he speaks out against the pundits. And I'll tell you where I'm starting to see and hear a lot. And I'd love your, your thoughts about this. So we're, you know, we're talking about this in February, at the end of February in 2024. I'm seeing a lot about, uh, have the markets run up too far? Are they set for a pullback? And people will have a, a variety of reasons. And these are the pundits right now. That's what they're, that's what they're talking about. Buffett and his sister Birdie say, you know, ignore, ignore the, ignore the pundits. I'm reading and seeing all this, all this, coverage about are the have the markets topped out are they going to decline uh, for whatever reasons and i keep going back to a uh, peter lynch quote that says something to the effect of more money's been lost in anticipation of a decline than in the decline itself and so adrian i, I want to ask you your thoughts on buffett saying yeah ignore the pundits uh avoid the hot stocks. And, you know, in the context of today, Lynch's quote on more money being lost. What do you think about what Buffett said, the Lynch quote? Am I connecting things right? Do you take the other side? Well, yeah, I do think you're uh, really drawing on the important point here. And he also just goes on to say, ultimately, what you want to look for are enterprises or businesses that are capable of deploying additional capital at high future returns. And that's ultimately the name of the game when it comes to investing. Businesses that are making money today and are making smart investments today to really garner future returns for, for those investors. And that ultimately can help in the different market cycles that happen every single day, month, year, whatever, whatever it is. And he also touches on as well just how technology has advanced and there's instant communication now compared to the past where you see this stuff every day, like you just mentioned, Roshan, articles, people saying takes on is the market overvalued right now? What should what should I do? And ultimately, I guess what Warren Buffett is trying to say here is saying that you really need to just look at what you're investing in how these companies are doing. He also talked about management as well. That's something that he really does focus on and really value at when he's vetting and looking at these businesses. So ultimately you can have to just really wave out some of the noise that goes on and just seeing, hey, where are the risks out there? What am I investing in? To really help guide you through uh, these turbulent markets as well. And then also touched on what you said about this, this gambling aspect of, of the markets as well, where the nature of speculation has just increased a lot right now where people are trading a lot more typically compared to how it used to be in, in the past where that's just increasing more and more where it comes to trading volumes as well and he wants the shareholders and investors to be more more aware about that as well and not really totally get away from investing for the for the long house as well as well so that's all something that i think he's really trying to point out to the people that are reading this letter just to be more aware of as markets continue to have volatility and, and news comes out. Yeah, you touched on so much there. I want to come back to, to a few things you, you, you said. Uh, so first is with the pundits comment I was saying, I think sometimes that's a lot of times 
that's what people get as their financial news, right? You turn on CNBC, uh, and what are what are what are they saying about investing? You read the Wall Street Journal market section. What do they say about what's going on with the market now? You look at Barrons, and they've got one every every week about about that in in their article. So, uh, and what Buffett is saying, and what you touched on about companies with return on capital. He, he and I'm reading this from page five of his letter, our goal at Berkshire is simple. We want to own either all or a portion of a business that in, enjoy good economics that are fundamental and enduring. So looking for, so I, I'm going back here and you, you touched on the, nec the next point about return on capital, but if you're someone listening to this episode or reading uh, Buffett's letter and he's saying, ignore the pundits, uh, think long-term, don't worry about uh, you know, what, what, what's going on, avoid the hot stock. I think some people will be thinking, well, then what do I do? And I think here's where the answer is provided by Buffett. And here's where Adrian, you and I can, can act, uh, help and you know, provide some information on, on our, on our podcast is look for companies, look for good businesses. You do that, whether the market's up, you do that when the market's down, you do the same thing. Your temperament doesn't change. Your time isn't spent differently. If you're an investor looking, uh, trying to find ways to deploy your portfolio, you just look for those good businesses in all times. If you're someone who's not looking into investments like this, you don't want to own stocks, don't feel comfortable owning stocks, well, then you can also ignore the pundits, but then you can look into indexes. Great time for me to say our disclosure right here. Disclaimer, please, this is not investment advice. We're just giving you things to think about. We're trying to help you, you become a better investor. And if you want investment advice, please reach out to me, reach out to Adrian. We can work with you specifically on your, on your situation, but we're not providing any advice right now. We're telling you what we do with our time and what we think uh, Warren Buffett's advising you to do on his letter. So ignore the pundits and the hot stock. Just try to find those businesses that enjoy good economics that are fundamental and enduring. Continuing on with that, he is Adrian, what you said, they're uh, particularly in favor of the rare enterprise that can deploy additional capital at high returns in the future. What does that mean? Well, that means that business can keep doing what it's what it's doing. Um, and I'm not I have not looked into this company recently, but I thought of it because my son wants me to take him to Starbucks all the time. And I always tell him. I don't want to pay. He likes to get it getting of uh, he used to at least get a Frappuccino. And I would say, I don't want to pay five bucks for this milkshake that I can get for you for a dollar fifty at McDonald's. Right. Maybe it's two dollars at McDonald's, whatever. The point is, Starbucks is charging more. How that applies in this in this scenario is if they're making that thing that they're charging me five bucks for for a dollar, they're now making. Uh, you know, four X on that. Now they have bill expenses. They've got to pay their employees. They've got to pay their, their rent. They've got to pay for the ingredients and, and all that in there. But can Starbucks open another store and deploy additional capital? So put more money into this other store to get these high returns of selling $5 milkshakes that we know McDonald's sells for a, you know, $2 or whatever, whatever it is. That's just my example. This is what he's saying. Can they continue to expand that very same business they're in where they're, where they're generating high returns on capital? And if they can, they'll continue to grow and expand that business. That's the kind of company that he likes to, to own. And simply you buy it and you hold it and that's it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. And he also mentions, uh, an indicator or something that people look at when they are looking for different businesses out there, individual companies. He talks about earnings and he says like, although earnings is a good metric to look at businesses, it can be a limited concept and it's a good place to start when you're looking at it, but there's a wide variety of things that you look at here. And he just addresses that predicting winners and losers in capitalism is challenging. So you have to have a lot, you have to do a lot of research, do a lot of homework and really expand your horizon to see what opportunities are out there and what indicators you're going to use if you think an investment is a good fit for you. Uh, yeah. And you know, with the earnings thing you mentioned, he does release um, uh, in, in the letter what operating earnings as well, because 
uh, and when you see the the difference in it with Berkshire Hathaway, it, it's huge. So they they report their earnings. I'm looking for these numbers as we as we speak, and I'll read them off to you. Ninety billion in earnings for 2021, minus 23 billion for 2022, and 96 billion for 2023. Then he says what their operating earnings are. 27 billion point six billion for 2021 so that's like a 63 billion dollar difference 30 billion positive for 2022 versus a 23 billion negative it's a 50 billion dollar difference for 2022 and then in 2023 96 billion versus 37.4 billion so a 60 billion dollar difference and the difference for Berkshire Hathaway is unrealized gains or losses. That's the gains or losses in their investments that they that they haven't sold. What you mentioned, Adrian, is earnings themselves can be uh, manipulated. So you'll hear investors talk about different things. I recently listened to um, uh, to an interview with with uh, Bruce Berkowitz, who runs Fair Home Funds, and he just says what he's looking for is is what he call what he'll say is just cash in the register. Right. So he's looking at cash flows, what cash is actually there uh, after what um, uh, Buffett and Munger have said b- before they look at is what's called owner's earnings. So uh, looking at just earnings as they uh, as they are, don't actually give you uh, what you're looking for to make a, a sound investment decision. You hear the hesitation in my voice because there are some instances where you can use that. You've just got to know the type of business you're looking at to figure out which of these metrics are useful for you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. And then ultimately too, you just got to look at just the macro environment. You have to look at markets and economic fluctuations because Sometimes they go on to mention that sometimes there can be really sound businesses, strong businesses, but depending on the environment, their price might not reflect how they're doing. And ultimately, that goes into what we mentioned before, that markets on the short term can be a voting machine, but over the long run, they're a weighing machine, too. So that's also something they want to point out. And we've said this before, but that's potentially the... um advantage to the individual investor over Mm -hmm. like a a a mutual fund or something is time right when when a mutual fund manager has a bad year or a bad couple years that manager can be fired right but when you're looking at a stock yourself and if that stock has had a bad year or two and you research it and you think it's temporary and they'll get back to their the days uh you know when you bought them you can just hold and you're time frame can be the uh, the opportunity. I'm looking at a, a company right now where um, I believe this might be the case where they've got they've had a couple uh, a, a couple bad years and they're probably going to have another one, but they're selling cheap in a, a historical context and I'm in the middle of it so no decisions have been have been made as far as buying or not. but uh, I think the difference is my looking at it long term, versus some of the analysts uh, out there looking at it for you know one year i'm looking out five or ten and i think that's where there is potentially the opportunity for the uh investor if you can buy and hold and you know bringing it back to um uh to um what we're talking about uh, buffett's letter uh he his um his uh, sentence when we talked about deploying capital at a higher return adrian when you mentioned that the next sentence is only Owning only one of these companies and simply sitting tight can deliver wealth almost beyond measure. So finding that company and just holding it can be the move for you as the investor, similar to the coffee can portfolio we discussed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. I agree with that, Roshan. Yeah. And continuing on with the letter, he goes a little bit more deeper into uh, Berkshire Hathaway and things that apply specifically to uh, to the company itself, to Berkshire Hathaway itself. I do find some interesting statements here and things of uh, of value. So, Adrian, I'll I'll pick up with one with one of them that I that I found very interesting, and this potentially is an edge to the individual investor over a Warren Buffett is that he says 
Berkshire Hathaway nearly uh, occupies nearly 6% of the universe where it operates, meaning that there are only a handful of companies in this country capable of moving the needle. They can only look at a handful of companies out there that they can that they can buy. Whereas if if you're doing your research and your homework and investing, uh, investing for yourself or looking for someone someone like uh, uh, like Adrian or I that are not managing, um, you know, billions and billions of dollar like Buffett is, we're able to look at, at some of these smaller stocks that can they can move the needle that Berkshire Hathaway can't look at. Actually, in his, he ends that paragraph saying, all in all, we have no possibility of eye-popping performance. Uh, he's saying that uh, he can't, uh, because the company's gotten so big, he can't have eye-popping performance. He can have good performance, right? But, but nothing that phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it does help too that they're just very diversified as well. I think that's, very important when you're looking at individual businesses or just investing in general as well, because that really does help when it, you're talking about risk out there, having multiple income streams, just different ways to make money, depending on what the economic cycle is. That can be crucial depending on what you're investing in or what type of business is. where you're diversified. It can smooth, smooth it out a lot more over time. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that that's true. And you know, Berkshire itself, because of the businesses they own and the companies they own, companies as in the stocks they own, uh, does offer that diversification. Uh, he continues that point. I just want to uh, finish this before we move on. When he talks about how limited the companies are, he had says um, Berkshire should do a bit better than the average American corporation. Uh, it should also operate with materially less risk of permanent loss of capital. Anything beyond slightly better, though, is wishful thinking. This um, modest aspiration wasn't the case when Birdie, his sister, went all in on Berkshire, but it is now. He's saying they've mm -hmm. just grown so big that they expect to do better than the average company, but they can't have the phenomenal performance, as he said earlier, um, that, they, that uh, Buffett's had in the past, you know, if you look at the Buffett partnership, you know, before Berkshire Hathaway, even, you know, he, he had that phenomenal performance, but he should do better than the average company, but he won't do as well as he's, he's potentially won't do as well as he's done in the past. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And another thing I thought that was interesting or worth just pointing out as well. I, I don't know the best way to describe it, but just reading over the letter, he does have a very American lens on how he views like companies, businesses, he really looks domestically at opportunities, not saying that there's not options out there as well. But I think that's also too, just worth having discussion as well. People always when you talk about diversification, they think about different regions looking outside just whatever country you're at as well is something a, a way people or investors look to diversify as well, where if you read this letter, that doesn't really get a lot of light shine on it, where they really say, we don't see any opportunities, which doesn't mean they're not out there. But that's just something else that where you'd have to look into. Yeah, and, and there it, it does add other factors when he talks about his uh, um, uh, ownership in Japanese companies, he does talk about how he did it with bonds in Japan, so they can um, uh, minimize the currency risk. So, mm -hmm. but yes, a very, very American focus. I, I feel like that's, um, that's been a consistent thing with his, with his letters going back, you know, years and decades. Now, another part that I like, it's in the, the section he calls our not so secret weapon is he had said Berkshire's ability to immediately respond to market seizures with both huge sums and certainty of performance may offer us a large scale opportunity. So Berkshire keeps cash and they're able to take advantage of market declines. Uh, and that's where he has a sentence, for whatever reason, markets now exhibit far more casino-like behavior than they did when I was young. I see that as well. I think the online trading and now trading with your, with your app, you very much get people short-term focused and that are treating it like a casino. Yeah, I think uh, a term out there is gamification of trading and investing out there where, like you mentioned, like a lot of stuff is 
being accessed by people's phone nowadays. And when you talk about people's finances, investing as well, and they have instant access to that as well, it could lead to more speculative, more impulsive decisions, which can, you know, be favorable for you, but also not be favorable for you as well. It just really depends on the individual. But again, that's just something that he's trying to be, make people more cautious about and more aware of. Yeah, and you know, when you talk about favorable decisions and not or two things that that it makes me think of in the letter. The first is he comes down on Wall Street for a second. He says Wall Street would like their customers to make money, but uh, what they want, uh, what they want is activity, right? The feverish activity. So he's basically saying Wall Street just wants people to buy and sell. They'd like for them to make money, but what they want them to do for sure is to is to buy and sell. And then going on further with what uh, what you were saying, Adrian, uh, about making those good decisions is he had said, make a couple good decisions during a lifetime and avoid serious mistakes. Reminds me of a um, of a Munger quote that I had uh, pulled up for us. It says uh, it's remarkable how much long-term advantage people like us have gotten by trying to be consistently not stupid instead of trying to be very intelligent, right? So just don't make the, the, the uh, dumb mistakes and make a few good decisions along the way. And that should ha have you do well overall. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And try to learn from those mistakes as well can be beneficial. Yes. Yes. Um, he continues on talking about the strength of Berkshire uh, Hathaway when uh, uh, economic upsets occur as they will. Berkshire's goal is to be a function uh, to function as an asset to the country, as you said, Adrian, talking about the country similar to 08 and 09 and help extinguish the financial fire rather than be on, uh, among the companies that inadvertently or otherwise ignited uh the confl conflagration. So he's he's going to help put out the fires. That's why they keep so much cash on hand. Mm -hmm. And definitely helps what you said, just taking advantage of any opportunities that prices become favorable in their opinion. It's just a way for them to utilize the capital they have on hand and just be resilient depending on what adverse events happen in the future, I think is beneficial and can really draw a lot of lessons from investors out there, just depending on how their assets are structured, how their portfolio is set up. Can you withstand the ri the potential risk out there, even though you may not know what they are, just setting yourself up and minimizing risk wherever you can, can help out, help your future self out. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Very much uh, a, a focus on minimizing risk first versus uh, optimizing returns which mm -hmm. is a good way to protect your protect your portfolio once again avoiding the serious uh mistakes mm -hmm. yeah i like how you put that optimize risk while uh optimize return while reducing a risk is uh something that a lot of people can learn from yeah and i'd say you know just looking at buffett's letter in the reverse order right mm -hmm. you minimize risk first and then uh look at optimizing returns mm -hmm. um and he j talks about just being prepared, you know, having their their very strong balance sheet. He says um, diversified talks about the diversified earnings of Berkshire Hathaway, um, minimal requirements for cash. They don't pay a dividend. They only do share repurchases uh, when uh, the stock is cheap. So strategic versus always doing share repurchases. I think that's an important point, right? You'll look at companies that'll do share repurchases all the time. And sometimes you'll look at that and say, yeah, I, you know, I like share repurchases, but if they're doing it when the stock's overvalued, they're destroying value, right? I, I researched a company last year or the year before, I won't, I won't mention the name, but they were talking about share repurchases and they're very much uh, out there buying they're they're acquiring other companies at the time that's part of their growth model and they were saying well rather than acquiring companies now we're just buying back our shares because we're getting a better deal for our shares than we would when we're buying another company 
So I like that type of thinking and, and, you know, Buffett's talking about the same, uh, the same thing of, of, uh, man, really it's capital allocation, managing your money wisely. If it's a good idea to buy a share repurchase, do that. If there's a good stock out there to, to buy, you know, that Berkshire likes, they'll, they'll buy it. He's not paying dividends because he feels like he can invest the money better than, better than you, you and I can, or the other, you know, the other, uh, shareholders, uh, can, um, uh, he also talks about them holding, holding cash. Right. And, uh, and he said, we did not predict the time of economic paralysis, but we're always prepared for one. So we talked about never risking permanent loss of capital. Well, he's never risking putting uh, Berkshire Hathaway at risk of, uh, of going out of business, of not having capital to keep operating, right? Always staying in that good position. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I like how he mentions, I don't know exactly how he describes, but in the letter, he says like your company or your business to the shareholder, really showing how they're, you know, at the end of the day, are companies doing or is your investment doing what's in the best interest of their shareholder, depending on what type of risk are out there, I think is something that, you know, is, is notable. Yeah, I think he very is very conscious of knowing that he's managing other people's money. And, uh, and uh, another one, he says, um, though your money is commingled with ours, it does not belong to us. And I think very often you'll see whether it's a fund manager or a you know, CEO of a corporation. I don't think they always have that uh, mentality or attitude, right? It's, it's they're working for the shareholders. I think Buffett would have that just in the fact that he came up as an investor and you know, now runs this company you know obviously still is a, is an investor but he, he's very conscious of the fact that it's it's a privilege to manage these other people's money it's not his uh he's not entitled to do so mm -hmm. yeah exactly um a few other uh things we I, we mentioned the stock re uh, repurchases but another one i think you talked about this adrian you may not have uh talked about this quote but patience pays um and when you find a truly wonderful business, stick with it. Patience pays and one wonderful business can offset the many mediocre decisions uh, that are inevitable. That's what you mentioned earlier. I just found the, the quote was as I was going through my notes and wanted to uh, wanted to repeat it because I think that's a very valuable, valuable one, particularly when you consider what he had said earlier about the hot stocks or the mm -hmm. markets being like a. Uh, uh, like a casino or Wall Street, uh, you know, favoring feverish activity, he's really focusing on, on saying avoid those pitfalls, find a good company and own it, and you'll do well. Yep, I I definitely agree with that part. He continues to go into a little bit deeper about about um, um, Berkshire Hathaway and Omaha. If, if if you're listening out there and you're a, a shareholder and haven't been to the uh, to the uh, Berkshire Hathaway annual meeting, I would highly recommend it. I've been a few times. I've missed a few years, but I'm I'm going back this year, and uh, it's wonderful to be there in person. And uh, I highly recommend reading not only this annual letter but all of his annual letters. You can find all of them on the on the Berkshire Hathaway website, so you can go there and literally for for free get all of his annual letters and it'll it, it's just such a great uh, just a wealth of knowledge uh, it's a berkshire hathaway.com and you can pull this annual report read what we just did and all the all the previous years but i always find valuable lessons in in what he's written and and the more i read the more i look up to him and admire him as an as an investor uh adrian do you have anything else you you would add well, I definitely just enjoyed just seeing his perspective. I mean, he's been through a lot of different type of economic events, different market cycles. He's been investing so long. So it was really just interesting to see his take and how he views investing in businesses and looking at the markets and the economy as a whole. You know, like you mentioned, you can gain a, a lot of knowledge from everything as far as his experiences that he's gone through. Yeah. Yeah, I, I I really enjoy reading these letters. I've gone through the ones in the past, and as we're talking about it, I want to uh, 
to do that again. So I plan on rereading them again uh, just off this episode. So for those of you that are listening, we hope you enjoyed this episode and found it valuable. This has been another episode of the Retirement Lifestyle Show. Take control and achieve your goals. Schedule a conversation with Roshan, Adrian, or Eric today at retirementlifestyleshow.com. Roshan and Eric are certified financial planner practitioners. They, along with Adrian, are investment advisor representatives and serve clients across the U.S. with financial planning and investment advice through RTA Wealth. If you found this show helpful, gain knowledge, or enjoy the time you spent with us, tell your friends and leave us a five-star review. This will help others discover the show. To access our show notes, to download any of the tools mentioned in today's podcast, to ask us a question, or to schedule a conversation, go to retirementlifestyleshow.com. All opinions expressed by podcast hosts and guests are solely their own. While based on information they believe is reliable, neither RTA Wealth nor its affiliates warrants its completeness or accuracy, nor do their opinions reflect the opinion of RTA Wealth. This podcast is for general informational purposes only and should not be regarded as specific advice or recommendations for any individual. Before making any decisions, consult a professional. The show hosts offer investment advice through RTA Wealth Advisors, LLC, an SEC registered investment advisor, and securities through RTA Wealth Management, LLC, member FINRA, SIPC, and NFA. Finally, our music is The Chance by Jason Shaw in Audionautics. It's part of the YouTube Audio Library and it's licensed under a Creative Commons license. I am Ray Voices. Thank you for listening.